Next is going to be our first example and it's the exploratory data analysis. And what are we going to analyze and what's the machine learning problem that we eventually want to solve? Well, we're going to analyze census data and we're going to try and predict a binary yes, no, whether or not somebody will earn above 50,000 US dollars on an annual basis. The data set itself, we're going to pull it in using the folk tables API and the underlying data is managed by the US Census Bureau. And here, this is going to be about exploratory data analysis. So we're not quite building a model yet, but we're going to load in the data. We're going to perform some basic data processing. We're going to generate a couple of bar plots and histograms. And then we'll also look at scatter plots, correlation matrices, and then the two measures that we want to look at for bias are the CI norm and DPL value. And in this notebook, we're going to start by loading in all the libraries that we need. So for now, there is no machine learning happening quite yet. So we're only going to use the pandas library, matplotlib for plotting, and then we have folk tables to help us load in the data set. So when it comes to loading in the data using the folk tables API, first of all, we need to specify what the features are that we want to use from the PUMS data set. And here we have prepared a list of features that we are potentially interested in. So we have the age of an individual, the class of worker, the educational attainment, marital status, occupation, place of birth, relationship, hours worked per week in the past 12 months, the sex recorded detailed race code, person's weight, grandparents living with grandchildren and the school enrollment. If you want more details about all the available features, you can have a look at the data set itself. And there's also a full metadata file provided that explains what all these features are. So using folk tables now, we're going to set up what is called a basic problem where we define what the features are that we want to use. So you can see here features equals income features. So that's the list of features that we want to use. And then the target, the thing that we want to eventually learn to predict is going to be the total person's income feature. So this is going to be our target, but we're going to transform it into a binary problem. So the income itself is obviously a continuous numerical value. So that would constitute a regression problem, but we're going to use a threshold for above 50 K and below 50 K and denote that as ones and zeros. And we're also going to apply a little bit of pre-processing by filtering out the following conditions here. So we're only going to load in data for individuals that are above 16 years of age and that have a certain number of hours worked per week. In terms of post-processing, we're actually not applying anything. So you can see here, lambda x is x, so no change being applied. So now we're establishing the link to the data source. So we need to specify a year that we're interested in and then the time horizon, which is either going to be one year or five year. And then we can also specify the level of granularity. So do we want the information of the census data on an individual level or a household level? So we're going to do it on an individual or person level. The final thing that we can specify is the state from which we want to load in the data. And here we're going to specify California or in short CA. And we're actually going to download the data to our local instance. So the basic overview then, we're going to take the data that we just loaded in. We need to do a little bit of reshaping to get it into the traditional format for our data frame. And then with dataframe.head, we can display the information that we have in our data set. And you can see here the columns that we specified. And then we can also see a few missing values. So the shape of the data set and the total number of rows and columns that we have, we can see that displayed here, 14 columns and almost 200,000 records. With df.info, we can look at how many missing values we have, and we can see that the majority of the columns that we have have no or almost no missing values. And then there are a couple of columns that indeed do have a few missing values, GCL being one of them. 
What we can also notice is that all of the data is already coming in numerical format. So in this particular example, we actually don't need to do any re-encoding to turn things into numerical values, but this is not usually the case. So we do have another notebook that shows how to prepare data accordingly if we do indeed have categorical values and we want to use one hot encoding to turn them into yes, no indications. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to split between the categorical features and numerical features. So even though they are already encoded in the numerical format, we know that some of the features based on the names and the metadata that we have are indeed categorical features. So clearly the class of worker, that would be different categories, different job families versus the age being a continuous numerical value or the hours worked per week. So what you might notice now is that the namings are actually not that intuitive and if it weren't for the metadata file or me pulling in the naming descriptions, we would have a pretty rough time actually identifying what the individual columns are referring to. So a little bit of a recommendation here would be to rename the columns and give them slightly more understandable names. Okay. We're also going to recast the categorical features into object types and the numerical features. We can keep those as integer values or as float values. Either would be okay in this particular example because the values, if we look at what they are really referring to, the numerical features, it's going to be age and the hours worked per week and the record granularity is actually on integer level. So now this is going to be our recast version of the data set. And next we want to split between the model features and the model target. So the model target is going to be whether or not somebody earns above 50,000 US dollars. And then the model features is the combination of the categorical and numerical features that we have in the data set. One quick check that we want to do is whether or not the model target is in the model features. This check is very important because if the model target is part of the model features, very likely the model will just pick up on the target. And then when it comes to actually productionizing the model or testing it on test data, we will see a big drop in performance. So you should always make sure that your model target is not part of the features that you use for training. So now we're going to start plotting a couple of examples, but when it comes to plotting the categorical data that we have in our data set, we want to do a quick check on how many unique instances there are per feature to avoid plotting any particular charts with hundreds of individual categories. So here we're just showing all of the different features where we have less than 10 unique instances. And now we can have a look at the bar plots and histograms. So the first one and most important one is the distribution of the target variable. So again, as a reminder here, what we're trying to predict is whether or not we have an income above 50,000 US dollars. And here we see as zeros and ones indicated the distribution of the target. So this is actually not too imbalanced. So we can take some actions, but what was going to be really important is we need to check if this distribution is similar for the different subpopulations in our data set. So this is what we're going to do next. And obviously there could be many different attributes that constitute different subpopulations. The one attribute that we will focus on here is the racial feature, which is denoted as RAC1P. So what we have here now is again the same target but now overlaid with different colors are the different racial attributes and we can clearly see that for some groups the ratios are indeed quite different. We also want to have a look at the features so we can have a look at the racial feature so that could be one of the interesting features to look at and we have the 
distribution here. So once again, if we actually wanted to decode what these values stand for, we would have to refer back to the metadata. And this again brings me back to best practice of recording the actual information because then when it comes to debugging and actually looking at the data set to infer meaning, it makes sense to have the true values in there. So somewhere in the metadata, it would state what 16829375 refer to. What we can also do is we can look at the count of the different outcomes so above or below 50k indicated now as two different colors for the different racial groups and here we are starting to see some really stark differences for group eight in particular we have almost three times as many zero outcomes so less than 50k as we have for more than 50k if you compare that to group six it's actually almost at par with one another. So clearly there are different groups that have also very different outcomes. And just to contrast this with another feature where we would not expect to see any particular drop in the outcomes, I'm using here the GCL, the Grandparents Living with Grandchildren feature. And as was to be expected, there's actually no big difference that we can observe here. So both for one and two, so whether or not there are grandparents living with grandchildren or not, we actually see that the outcomes are relatively similar. And obviously we can also slice and dice this data further. In fact, we could also add yet another attribute, this time sex to overlay and look at the outcomes now. So we have class of worker, sex, and the count of the model target being the hue that we're using here to encode. So moving on to numerical data. For numerical data, we need to create something what is called histograms. So we actually need to bucketize our data points. So usually for numerical values, we would have a continuous range of values, and then we would need to bucketize those values. And we can bucketize them by using what is called bins. So here what we're doing is we're creating 10 bins, so all of the numerical values that we have, they will be split and assigned to these individual buckets that we have here. And what we can see is that we have obviously a starting point somewhere in the range of 20. Keep in mind that we did actually filter our data set to start at 16. So this is also now represented by seeing this cutoff on the left hand side. And then we see these double humps here with one spike at 30 and then the other one at 50. So the question now is, is there any particular reason as to why we would see these two spikes here? And we could overlay, for example, with sex again to see if there are any underlying relationships and we can keep looking for these patterns. And it might be that there are two particular attributes or more attributes combined that give rise to that bimodal, the double peak situation that we have here in this chart. Obviously, we can also plot them separately. So rather than stacking them, we could also look at the plots separately. What we can also do is we can get the outline using the KDE distribution plot. So this is now all plots generated using Seaborn, which is particularly good when you're looking at any distributions or correlations, or you want to generate pair plots. And in fact, we're going to generate one more type of plot, which is going to be our scatter plot. So if you want to plot one numerical feature versus another numerical feature, we can use what is called a scatter plot. And this is what we have here. So our two features, the two numerical features that we have in the data set are age and the hours worked per week. So we can see them here. And now we would want to overlay the outcome to see if there is a particular emergence of patterns in here. And we do see something that we expected where with more hours worked per week and also with more advanced age, 
we see more people that actually earn above 50,000 US dollars. And the final thing that we want to do here is we want to generate a correlation matrix. We've seen those already on the slides. And the idea here is to use a heat map and dataframe.core to get the individual values. And we can also split them or create correlation matrices for the different racial groups that we have in this data set here. This is what's shown now. And what we can actually observe here is that the correlations are different depending on the different racial groups. So concluding now, we're going to look at the CI norm and DPL value. We've seen the equations on the slides and here we're just going to calculate them. So it's going to be a very simple counting and filtering. We can slice and dice the data by filtering for the different outcomes and filtering for different racial attributes. In this particular example, we're going to compare group one and eight. And we get a DPL value of 0.25 if we round up. And for CI norm, we get a value of 0.68. So obviously this is due to the group eight and one having a significantly different number of data points within them. And then from the DPL value, we can also conclude that the outcomes are indeed different. So the number of positive outcomes or the fraction of positive outcomes is different between group one and group eight.